today I'm in Crown Court for refusing to do my unpaid work, my community service, uh, for just a pile, basically. I got sentenced to um, community service for the Formula One action for trying to raise awareness on the climate emergency. Now, um, part of uh, doing what I do is I'm in civil resistance against the British government. I'm literally caught in a non-violent conflict with the British government um, to try and make them take action on the climate emergency. And uh, I, know not, I know a lot of people don't really worry about it and some people don't even believe in it. But um, the breakdown of the living world is happening before our eyes and our children's futures don't stand a chance. They don't stand a chance unless we act now. Help. We need to inform, start massive radical changes in our society. We need to change the way we grow our food. We need to stop burning fossil fuels. We need to stop drilling for all new oil and gas. We, and we need to rapidly transition to green energy. The decision, right, the decision to not go to my community service as punishment wasn't a, a choice out of pure logic and reasoning. It was a choice, it wasn't, it wasn't a choice, it was an emotional response because I feel so betrayed by our British government that, you know, they're literally selling out our futures and it's, I'm going to try and explain what it feels like to actually be um, a climate activist who's aware of the climate crisis and fighting to protect it. It feels like, imagine you're trapped in a house. Like, we're not trapped in a house, imagine you're upstairs in a house. One sec, try going past. Imagine if uh, you were trapped in, sorry, if, imagine if you were upstairs uh, in a house with all your family and you go downstairs to the kitchen and there's a massive raging fire and it's licking up the, it's licking up the uh, stairs and there's smoke coming upstairs. You run back into the room and you try and get everybody to leave the house or, you know, act like it's an emergency, get up and, do, you know, respond the way you'd expect them to. And, um, but none of your family, everyone you speak to says, uh, oh, be quiet, Coronation Street's on. Or, you know, you, you shoes them, you, you, you use oil to get to work, you're a hypocrite. And you just, you, you just say, you say something like, there's literally a huge fire, we need to get out of here right now. If you, if you can imagine putting yourself in that scenario, where there's a fire downstairs, and your family are not listening to you, you're trying to get them out, and no one's paying attention to you, then you can start to understand how it feels to be somebody who's on the, trying to, protect this world because that's how I feel and if you was in that situation you'd be losing your you'd be losing your mind you'd be you'd be you'd be, you'd be devastated you'd be trying to drag them out of the house but you but if you if you couldn't if, if you couldn't do that you would just you'd, you'd probably have a breakdown because you, you can't leave without them as well because you're, you're trapped in the house too um god damn why is no one aware of this yet? We are standing in defense of all of life on earth. Our governments are corrupted beyond belief. They're owned by corporations. Um, they're selling out our children's futures. And here at like Activism Uncensored, um, I'm gonna be interviewing people from across the board of all different, uh, all, from all different groups from Just a Pile and Extinction Rebellion, which you've already seen, uh, but I'm going to try and be getting on uh, some people from Palestine Action and um, yeah, all, mainly all the groups. But more importantly, if, if I go to prison today, I'm, I'm actually not even bothered because, like, I'm, because of, I've, I'm, in, I'm in Manchester Crown Court for not doing my unpaid work today and they're probably going to send me down but I'm doing a bit of recording outside the studio um, and Elvis will be here soon but um, 
yeah, the reason I don't care is because I've lost uh, my fear of um, of prison. Like, I've lost my fear of prison. There's, like, there's literally nothing they can do to me right now. Like, it's um, it's a strange one to explain, really. Um, but it's a powerful place. Like, I have my integrity and I, um, you know, stand for what I believe in. We're outside Manchester Crown Court today. Um, I'm basically getting fucked today, uh, potentially sent on to prison. Um, Tim's come to support me, do you want to say hello? Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, I've Tim, I've just come along to support Josh because uh, Crown Court's a serious place, uh, climate crisis is a serious thing, so I thought I'd come along and say, offer my support. So uh, where, where did I meet you then? Uh, yep. uh, we met uh, a couple of times, but most recently at Envirolution, mm. which is uh, a festival of sort of environmental awareness and um, campaigning and increasingly about the climate crisis more than anything else um, in Platfields in, uh, in South Manchester. Yeah, that was quite a nice day actually, quite sunny. Um, have you uh, considered taking action yourself or have you done any action in the past with any, um, any of the groups? Uh, so yes, uh, I'm a, I'm a non-violent direct action trainer uh, for Extinct Rebellion. So um, there's the- That's right, that's right. Yes, go on, go on. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No. So uh, yeah, you've heard of Extinct Rebellion. Uh, that's the, the main group I'm involved with. Um, you know, obviously there's Just Up Oil and there's Insulin Britain. Um, but yeah, so uh, one of the things I do is I train people to take action in a non-violent way. We're non-violent. We don't believe in violence as the answer, but we do believe in that answer. Well, uh, we we have non-violence training in Just Up Oil as well. I think that's where it stemmed from. Um, there's something very powerful in uh, the the theory of non-violence. Uh, me being here today and refusing to do my own paid work is a form of civil resistance, like I'm refusing to be violent. I will not be violent, but I, um, I will, sorry, it's okay. <laughs> I will not give my labor for work, but I won't be violent, basically. It's, it's a form of resistance, in my opinion. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm very glad we don't have the United States uh, form of justice system where people have forced labor in prison. It's, it's, uh, too close to slavery and then the history there is terrible uh, so we don't have that um, and um, I guess you are give, being given a, an awful choice of doing the, the, the labour unpaid or going to prison and you're choosing an option to, to make a point or you're hoping right that you don't that you get the best outcome right Josh <laughs> about to go in dude you just made it in time yeah uh, good luck today you know best wishes i mean this is your decision uh, for what you've done and you've explained on the channel in recent episodes why you uh taken the decision um not to do community service um just want to wish you all the best today mate and just take us through again <laughs> I, why I can't, it is that you're doing this well i refuse to give them my labor as punishment uh, I've, i was explaining this before uh to tim here um but basically like People who get sent to do community service have done something wrong. They've done speeding or driving, or like whatever something. They've done something, and they know they've done something wrong. Whereas yeah. in my case, I believe in what I've done, yeah. and I'm not sorry for it, and I'd do it again. And then more than that, I feel betrayed by our government because they're selling out our children's futures and our futures. And look at the, this, it, you know, the weather is breaking down all around the world, and they're continuing yeah. to invest in fossil fuels. So, like, it felt like having to say sorry when I'm really not and it's just something I could it just didn't sit right with me. So I'm taking it as a form of civil resistance against this state. Well, if that's your decision and that's based on your principles, uh, then hopefully the judge will see your side of things. Uh, but we'll, we'll see what happens today. You know, well, we're going to carry on with a follow-up report, whatever happens, um, but best of luck. And uh, like you're saying, yeah, climate collapse is happening all around us and uh, people have to stand up in this way, you know, whether it's to the courts or the police or the government. Um, so I'd like, I'd like um, but if, I, if, I, if I do get sent down today, um, if, if, if you could like make a short video outside here on your phone, like with the, with the result, and you can add it onto the end of this interview, uh, or if not, I'll, I'll be doing it. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I might be sort of air myself in a, in, a, in a couple hours, but I really doubt it. Yeah, hopefully we'll both be here in a couple of hours, but if, if not, I'll be here with a follow-up report and um, we'll, just, we'll just see what happens, mate. Yeah, so uh, remember, uh, also, another thing I want to talk to you about, actually, is I, wa I, want to I want to continue, I'm just going inside in a minute, is I want to continue the podcast from inside prison and I figured out how to do it. Yeah, well, um, if, that, if, 
it comes to that, yeah, then you'll still be in from Josh, don't worry. Uh, viewers, we're going to be continuing with the podcast, um, whatever the result today, so stay tuned for more videos. Like and subscribe. Yeah, like and subscribe. And, um, you know, the future of all coming generations, their fate rests on our, in our hands. And our children's futures rest in our hands. And we need to find the courage to act like it. Thank you. Currently getting a coffee. They uh, gave us the uh, wrong time. We've, got, uh, we've actually got until uh, half 11. So we're we'll going to do some more recording in the meantime. Morning. Anyway, yeah, so. Um, why don't you uh, tell us something, about, well, since we've got some time now, why don't you tell us what's been happening in London, Elvis? Because um, I've been missing out. And it's quite windy right now, so you better talk right into it as well. Yeah, uh, been down in London for most of the last six weeks uh, where the slow matches are happening. Um, obviously, this is a new tactic that just stop all the using. It's causing disruption, but with a lot less risk of arrest. Um, but if you've been following us in the press and things like that, um, you'll have seen this new tactic. It's just as effective. It's got Yo. the Tories in a stir, um, and the police don't know how to react to it. They're trying to use this. Section 12s. We'll I've got it. It's on. Uh, they're trying to use Section 12s um, to get people off the road, but they've not been issuing them correctly, and that's been quite embarrassing for them in a lot of cases. They've had to de-arrest de people. Uh, the Just Up All supporters behind me who've been on the slow march today have been uh, detained and arrested illegally. Uh, the Section 12 was not issued properly. Uh, there have been five arrests and at the moment we're just waiting to hear what the situation is. Uh, we're not sure if they'll be de-arrested or if they'll be going into custody. against this criminal genocidal government. Nothing else works. We've tried all the usual methods, petitions, writing to MPs, writing to newspapers, going on legal marches, agreed with the police, it doesn't work. This technique has worked over and over again with the suffragettes causing civil disruption, the, the human rights movement, apartheid in South Africa, um, the Indians with Gandhi getting the oppressive British rule out and it has worked over and over again. It's the only thing that the government will listen to. Um, the regions are coming round every week. A different region goes over to London, uh, does daily slow marches Monday through till Friday and then a big coalition march on Saturday. Um, and we've got one coming up. I'm just going to do a quick plug for the 24th. Um, that's a week on Saturday. That's uh, dedicated to our friend Marcus, mm -hmm. um, who's been threatened with deportation once his uh, sentence is complete. Uh, the Home Office are threatening to deport him to Germany, um, which is absolutely unjust. It's an affront to um, to justice, really. Yeah, so what I heard about Marcus is um, that it's because his sentence is longer than one year. They, they, they can have the right, they, they're legally allowed to deport him back to his country to serve his sentence in his home country. Yeah, that's what they're saying. Um, but we don't think that's fair. Uh, we don't think that the sentences that they got in the first place are, are justified either. Um, that's why we did the Not My Bill um, demo a few weeks ago in London. That's why Just a Paul with her. And uh, for all the other people who've been affected by the Public Order Bill as well. Uh, this bill's basically trying to silence everybody's right to protest. Um, and you might not agree with what Just Up All and other environmental organisations do, but at the end of the day, um, there might come a time when people want to protest about something else and that right will be taken away from them, whether we agree with whatever they're protesting against or not. And we don't think that's right. We think everybody should have a fair right to protest in, in the street, um, which not a lot of people realise is... Uh, their right to do, you know. Uh, it's only really when you, you know, look into the law and look into the rights that, that people find out that we do have a right 
to go into the road and protest. Uh, it's the police's job to decide whether there's a certain amount of disruption that um, isn't safe for the public and that's when they're supposed to be issuing a section 12 um, but the, the judgment of the, the police and um, the government has, has proven to be sort of off kilter shall we say yeah. yeah of course you know I've been thinking about um, this government and the court system and the police and the biggest weapon they have against all of us is our fear of them our fear of them and what they can do to our lives. Like, you think, I don't want to ruin my life to, you know, going down that route, but really their weapon is fear. So today, their weapon is fear. Like, they want me to be afraid of going to being sent to prison. That's their, that's their, that's their angle, right? That's why they got their power, because that's what they can do to me. But I'm not afraid of that. And once you lose your fear of prison, um, it doesn't. It doesn't. So you don't see it as like a, it's not even that sort of punishment. Like maybe a long prison sentences are, but short ones aren't that bad. Like you know, like there's nothing wrong with like a few weeks in prison uh, for uh, like um, taking part in peaceful protesting. You get you know free, free accommodation, like free heating and food and you know showers and telly and kettle, and tea, coffee, milk. Your sugars, your pencils, your drawing, you know, your painting classes, uh, your, your jogging yard, your, you know, the lap you can do. Um, usually just, a, just a, a yard you can run around in a circle. There's not really like a, a full circuit or anything. But like, it's not, uh, it's not that bad. Like, and if it's between that and unpaid work where I've got to go and um, turn up somewhere every day, not every day, sorry, turn up somewhere once a week, and, you know, I'm, from then on forward, I'm not allowed to use my phone. I'm treated as a prisoner. I'm taken to, let's say, Oldham Football Car Park. And there's about 20 of us standing around whilst two people sweep and uh, one person shovels into a wheelbarrow. And you have to stand there all day. Like, they don't even make you work. They just make you stand there. Right. So the actual, you don't think that the work that they give you is productive so it doesn't you know it, it, it's just it's just to have authority over you and to exercise authority over you and just to show that like the, the work that you're doing is like basically like you say next to nothing so it's just a form of punishment more than the fact that you're you're doing a role you know that needs doing just, yeah it's just does that just I mean the sake of it. yeah just giving you the job for the sake of it yeah, it requires a level of um, submissiveness and surrender and, in my opinion, like, giving up a little bit of your integrity, uh, you know, to, 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 like, okay, I'm, I'm, it's like, it's like, you know, if you're sent to prison for protesting and they say, right, now you've got to get a job in the prison, and you say, no, I don't, and they say, no, but you have to, and you say, uh, well, Actually, no, I don't. Well, it's that or else. Well, I'll choose or else, and I do have a choice. And I will take the punishment, and I will not work. I'll do, I'll do the same in prison. I, I'll, they, can, they can do whatever they want to me. They can do whatever they want to me. They will not have my compliance, and they will not have my integrity. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, your decision. And those choices will get put to you. And that's just like you were saying earlier. That's the different levels of fear that they're trying to instill into you. Um, you know, you've already been taken away from society for however long as part of your punishment, and then they're saying that you have to do mandatory labour, um, otherwise you risk getting a longer sentence or, or further punishment because of it. Um, <clears throat> and that's something, that is something about the penal system um, and I guess we're picking that up, you know, from the American penal system, which has the most people in prison per capita in the world. And you even get large corporations who use prisoner labour, um, you know, sportswear companies and things like this. Um, I won't name any individual. I will. I will. <coughs> they've got. They've got. They've got um, prisoners selling selling gas and electric for uh, for Shell in in Peterborough prison. They've got a. 
they've got a fucking call centre in um, yeah in the prison and they get they pay, they pay the prisoners um, two pounds a day to work in it and also 25p for every sale they make and I'd have think that's that's a privately run company as well like that just doesn't sit right with me like our system is so unbelievably corrupted it's unbelievable like the 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 money and the, and the billionaires and the capitalists have infil infiltrated every level of our society yeah it's almost like they want the prisons full you know because that helps the businesses um it does and that's why people get harsher sentences and definitely uh in america and probably definitely here um let's say that ethnic minorities who were charged get given longer sentences for minor offenses and when you look at how many people of color and things are in the american prison system like you say working for a pittance two pound a day i mean two pounds a day if out here in the real world you know that wouldn't even put money on the table for your family would it mate and uh oh what they offering you a little bit of uh commission was it 25p per sale uh that's just that's just nothing um can i say so this has been uh, proven to be a thing in America, but imagine law, law, law creators, people in, the con in Congress um, who actually write the laws, having shares in the private prison sector. Like, there's nothing to stop congressmen in America from owning shares in private prison. There's nothing to stop the UK politicians from buying shares. There's, there's nothing to stop R Rishi Sunak from buying shares in um, the private prison system. Well, like, in uh, in this country, it's G4S, Group 4 Security Corps, who own a lot of the prisons, run a lot of the prisons. Yeah, but who owns them? Well, exactly. Um, it's big corporate money. At the end of the day, let's say hypothetically, if overnight everybody became a law-abiding citizen, the government might not actually like that so much because there's so much private money in the prison system that these companies are going to be turning around and saying, was all, was all our staff gone? Uh, you've taken all of our staff away. There aren't enough people in the prisons now. And you know what they'll probably do then, Josh? What? They'll probably turn around to the government and say, we want reparation money. We want compensation money. As the same as what happened like when the slave trade ended. And ag again, this could be happening within uh, climate issues as well. For example, if we do move over to renewables, companies like Shell and BP are going to be wanting money from the government. They're going to be wanting taxpayer money, our money, from the government because they're going to be losing business if we move over to renewables. And our children and grandchildren could still be paying that, and great-great-great-grandchildren would still be paying that out of their taxes as well because it was only a few years ago that our tax money, me and you, stopped being contributed towards the reparations made towards the slavers, you know, over a hundred years ago. And that's just absolutely gross. We're fighting this system. Is my water over there? There it is. We're fighting this massive system and it's so powerful, it's a beast. Mm. It's, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a massive wall of corporate money that they, they, influ they, they own like lobbying groups who, who lobby politicians in certain directions like and the more money you've got the more lobbying you can do and you know if, if you've got hundreds of millions of pounds or billions of pounds income every year then you could easily like you know drop a couple million in a, in a, in a politician's pocket and pay for his campaign yeah. and offer him lucrative job deals after his, after his terms ended and you can buy a politician and that politician can work for you. Um, and that's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing in democracies all over the world. It's a sham democracy. It's a pantomime. It's, um, you know, in this country we've got Conservative and we've got Labour and I see them as two sides of the same coin. And when you flip that coin in the air, no matter which side it lands on, it always lands in the banker's pocket. So, deluded if you think voting Conservative or voting Labour really means anything and another thing that this um, government and the ruling elite try to do in this country is try to divide us divide us again, along all the lines that they can do uh, any line they can find so like immigrants people who are people who are left people who are uh, right pe people 
people who have a different colour skin from you, people who have a different religion to you. The newspapers are owned by these same, same corporate powers and they work to divide the population, to make it create infighting within itself. Like, the more, the more racist morons there are in this country, that's the, the better it is for the corporations because as, a divided, as divided we'll fall, but united we can, we can, we can stand. We can, we can stand united and take them down. Yeah, you're right. And a lot of the uh, people in corporate boardrooms are indistinguishable from the politicians, you know. They all went to the same schools together, they're best friends together. I mean, look at Liz Truss, the first company she went to work for when she left university was Shell, and she ended up being the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Um, is that and true? There's this divide yeah, that's yeah, true. Is, that's, that, yeah. is that really true? It's true, yeah. And there's this divide and rule thing going on, like you're saying. And you're going to see this especially uh, probably next year when the general election is scheduled because the Conservative Party don't have a Brexit to sell anymore. They're starting this culture war um, and it's going to be billed as the war on woke, which basically means, as we've said before, you know, any, any progressive principle they're going to label as woke, try and start a phony culture war uh, against anyone who's progressive or principled whatsoever. So they're going to be trying to divide common people based on race, based on uh, all these other things. And it's, it's, just, it's just sick um, because they know that if the people come together, you know, um, all races, all different elements of society come together against them, then, then they don't stand a chance. So they'll, they'll, go after, uh, they'll go after people who aren't straight. They'll go after people who aren't white. Uh, they'll go people, after people who aren't on the right or on the hard right. Um, or people who have different religions. Or people of different religions, yeah, exactly. You, I mean, we saw that before the last general election, um, using anti-Semitism as a political football, and what happened um, with Jeremy Corbyn and the, and the Labour Party in this ridiculous anti-Semitism scam, which has been long debunked now, and there are still people on the right still trying to uh, label Jeremy Corbyn as an anti-Semite, which if you look at his career and his principles, he absolutely is not. He is the exact opposite. He stands up against racism and always will and always has. I was going to say, Jer Jeremy Corbyn uh, presented a threat to this government. He, he, he presented a threat to all the big, powerful money um, corporations that, that rule our government because they knew they couldn't buy him. He, he had principle. They, they knew that that man had principles, and no amount of money they threw at his feet they could not they could not change his policy decisions. So they could not allow him. Like yeah. they could not allow they could not allow a man like that to come to power. Just follow the money and look at the fact that out of all the MPs, over 600 MPs in the House of Commons, guess which MP claimed the least amount of expenses uh, during his time? Let me guess. Jeremy Corbyn. So he's he's not in politics for the money. He's in it for the community, and he's a you know community guy. He's still the MP uh, for Islington North. He's probably going to stand as an independent. Now. Well, one day he's going to be on our podcast. Well, we'll hope so. Uh, well, you know, I've had the pleasure being on marches out with him uh, from right here in Manchester. We set off from this very spot, Piccadilly Gardens, last year when we went to do the uh, the Peterloo march down at St Peter's Square, and there were loads of organisations there. Um, I've met Corbyn before. I used to be a member of the Labour Party. I used to campaign for them. Um, and he's just such a well-principled guy that, like you pointed out, the establishment don't want that. They need, for their interests, for people like that to be taken out of the picture. And the, the methods are despicable. Um, the methods that they use to attack principled people with progressive... Uh, ideas that could really help this country, help millions of people, um, not just in terms of wages. Remember, it was also going to start the, the, the Green New Deal. Um, it's, it's only the second week of July, and I've been down in London. We had like three days in a row where it was 30 degrees. I mean, it's only lunchtime here in Manchester. We're sat here now, it's, it's baking the second week of July, and we'd be in our, what, fourth year of a Labour government if the establishment hadn't had their way. And Bearing in mind, I do have to point out, it wasn't just the Conservative Party. There was a lot going on within uh, the central Labour Party that worked against Jeremy Corbyn, un unfortunately. Um, and that's, that's, that's the way it turned out, and that's why it was so disappointing in 2019 uh, that that progressive um, democratic socialist 
government didn't get elected because there'd be a lot more being done uh, for the climate crisis. Uh, we probably wouldn't have had to have done as many actions as we've as we've done because we'd have Labour's Green New Deal. But here we are. We're still stuck with the Tories, and we have been for the last like four years. Um, so politically, we'll just have to see what happens. And we're but we're a far cry away from having a progressive uh, in number ten at the moment. Unfortunately. What do you think? Of, what do you think about uh, Keir Starmer? I don't trust him, basically. <coughs> to be honest, um, personally, he's, he's the reason why I left the Labour Party. Um, that was over an incident. I don't know if um, the people watching all remember this at the time. Uh, Maxine Peake wrote an article for The Guardian uh, basically criticising Israel. And like we were saying about this anti-Semitism scam, they were trying to basically act as though they don't know the difference between a state and a religion. Um, so any criticism of Israel was labelled as anti-Semitism. And what happened was um, the MP, Rebecca Long-Bailey, shared the article that Maxine Peake had written for The Guardian on Twitter and then was immediately suspended. Um, and I did have my doubts about Starmer when he was... Uh, when he was going for the leadership, he basically said he would carry on the principles of Corbyn and don't worry, you can trust me with the leadership. And basically, as soon as he got in, that all turned around immediately, he started to vilify him, started to vilify anyone who was closely associated with him in the Labour Party. And it's, it's still going on now, all of, all of the people who um, were very close with Corbyn. Can I say? Diane so, Abbott as well, um, he's, he's, other um, people. I think he's been purging. He's been purging the Labour Party. And I actually do believe he's just another politician who's been bought by corporate interests. Like, think about it. If they can buy a bunch of, if they can buy the leader of the Conservatives and the leader of the Labour Party, both of them are owned by the same corporations. Then it doesn't matter who wins, That's because right. they win. They win both ways. Yeah. That's right. And uh, since very early on in his career, he's had close ties with the establishment. He used to be, uh, you know, QC. Um, and I think he's just sticking to those establishment principles. Yeah, so not only do you not have control of your own government and you're being lied to, you're being lied to, you've been, you've, you've, you've the, the, the climate crisis, man. It's, it's, it's here and it's starting and the average person doesn't have a clue. Well, just look up now. Can you see a cloud in the sky at the moment, Josh? We're sat in Piccadilly Gardens. So, now let's, let's, um, talk about what's been in the press recently. Uh, I think it was just yesterday. Uh, the Daily Mail, right on the front page, are trying to make this tedious link uh, between organisations like Just Stop Oil and the Labour Party. Yeah. Um, and in the last few weeks, um, or, well, it's been known for a while now that, that Del Vince is a supporter of Just Stop Oil and has made donations to the organisation. He also donated £1.5 million uh, pounds to the Labour Party. So in a very desperate and long-winded way, the Daily Mail are trying to say that Just Stop Oil actually fund uh, Keir Starmer's Labour, which clearly isn't the case. Um, but what is actually good from that is that we've seen a lot of support recently uh, in Just Stop Oil from celebrities, you know, people like Chris Packham, um, mm. who's doing a documentary about climate change, has been very open about his support to us himself, 12 protesters from Just Stop Oil have just stopped the Old Kent Road, causing a significant amount of disruption, which just shows you how much trouble you can cause with just a handful of people. Peaceful, democratic trouble. The police have been amicable throughout, there's been no problems. I can't say the same for some of the motorists and pedestrians who've been extremely abusive and on one occasion dangerous. Um, my thoughts are simple really. You may have been inconvenienced, I've been inconvenienced. I've been, I've been stuck back there, just like many of you might have been, you know. You may not appreciate these methods. The methods are about getting us all to think about the biggest crisis in our lives and in our planet's history. But if you can't cope with the methods, think about the motivation. What has made this group of young and old people get up this morning, come to the capital, and, and, and they've told me they haven't slept. You know, they're intimidated, they're anxious. What's made them come here and protest like this? 
fear, the fact that they can't imagine a future. One of these young women has said that she wants a family, but she can't imagine being in a position where she can justify starting a family. You've got to have some sympathy for that, even if you're five minutes late to work. Dale Vince. Who, who was it? Who was it? It's, it's Dale Vincent, isn't it? Yeah, Dale Vince. Um, basically, in, over the last week, um, he, he offered to double any donation that was made to Just Up Oil. He would make a donation for two times the amount. Um, and then the Daily Mail uh, run this ridiculous story that that means that Just Up Oil are, are funding the Labour Party. But more and more celebrities are coming out to support um, climate organisations. George Monbiot was out marching with Just Up Oil alongside Dale Vince this week. Um, really? Yep. One of the greatest crises on Earth. Um, our burning of fossil fuels is going to bring Earth systems to an end. Uh, we have to leave oil, gas and coal in the ground. And our governments are not committed to doing that. And we will keep protesting until they are. Yeah, I'm here because uh, this is like the most important thing going on, right? We we know that we can't afford to find more fossil fuels. We can't afford to burn what we've already found, right? And our government are behaving in, in the most crazy fashion. An illegitimate government as well, by the way. Richard Sunak has never faced an election. He has no mandate to do this. He has no mandate for anything. He should do the decent thing and call an election. There's been support on social media from people like Gary Lineker, who uh, he cooling down yeah yeah it's it really is warm here and we're not just saying that because we're here doing a podcast about climate change it's probably you know feels at, at least in the mid 20s here it's probably going to get up to you know around 28 degrees second week of june can i, can I just add on as well do you know in these uh, in these big, big built up cities like we're in right now um you know all the artificial environments like the 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 pavements and the roads and the concrete and everything around us it, it absorbs more heat Whereas if you've got like tree cover and grass cover, yeah. like healthy grass cover, it cools uh, the it, it cools the environment down more. Um, but yeah, anyway, what, 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 you, what was that guy called again? Sorry, the the guy Payne who's been uh, tripling JSO donations. Uh, Dale Vince. Dale Vince. Yeah. So yeah, I saw his interview actually on the, on the news. He seemed like quite a reasonable, reasonable and uh, logical guy, but. It's just fascinating how uh, our right-wing press are trying to, you know, run this idea. And it's, it's shocking how many people believe it as well, because that's, that's the worst part. People actually believe this stuff. And, you know, we are, as a nation, parts of our nation are becoming more divided. And what, the, the division that we talked about before, they're actually succeeding. Like, it's not like, it's not like, well... It's a bit of hit and go because it's like they they polarising us, so they don't have to get everybody. All they have to do is get a, a section of the public to separate and then think see the other section as the other. So like you see someone with like piercings and blue hair, you think oh that's the other. They're they're probably left wing. They probably vote Labour. They're, they're not like me. They're different than me. But the truth is that person's just like you. Um, they are you. And I tell you the way this filters down. And when we're doing these marches, and I've been on several marches with Just Stop Oil, we hear these people who shout things from the side of the road. We do get support as well. I'm not just saying it's all criticism, but they'll, they'll blurt out a certain conspiracy theory and I'll get into thinking, well, where's this come from? It'll turn out that it was in a, a Daily Mail or a Daily Express, whatever article, Telegraph article, a couple of days before. And then, you know, obviously we're the ones who have to answer for it. But like you were saying there, the people are buying it and some people will unfortunately believe everything that they read in the, in the right wing press. I heard another one recently, I'm not sure where this, this guy got it from, we were uh, having a march in London, uh, a guy comes over, he, he claims that um, Just Stop Oil worked for MI5 and it's all a conspiracy theory to increase the sales of electric vehicles. What do you think of that one? Oh, Arthur, I've not heard that one before. Um, MI5... Well. Well, I mean, I can see the logic behind it. Um, do you know what? Do you know what? Even if... M <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Hang on, let me guess. Even if MI5 were funding Just Up Oil uh, to increase the sale of electric cars, 
I don't give a shit. Like, I, you know, taking civil resistance has given me a, a, a platform and I get to say what I want to say and I get to interview people. Like, people who come on this podcast, like, can advocate their own ideas. We don't, we're not advocating the ideas of MI5. We're advocating just general good ideas. So, like, if, if, if the British government want to give us a lot of money to help overthrow the British government, like... Yeah, well, let them be, let's let them be our puppets. Like, let's keep taking their money and have our own agenda. Like, I know a lot of the people in, in Just the Poyle. I know a lot of the people who are high up in Just the Poyle. Now, I can say personally that I don't get involved in any kind of queening or any kind of organising or any kind of planning. Um, I just know these people. And these people are so against this establishment in, just on principle, they probably would take their money and then not, like, just kind of, like, play them at like, their own game and use their money against them, um, which is what I would do. But I'm not, I don't even, I don't, I, I, do you know what? It's pretty funny, like, I wish that was a real thing because I know that Just the Poil ha has been financially struggling, which is why we've been, had this big uh, fundra fundraising campaign. Yeah. We've had people like, yeah, we've had people like Elvis who have been um, phoning people. Why don't you tell us a bit about that? Well, how, how does that work? Well, yeah, I know we've mentioned some of our more well-known donors and we're obviously grateful for celebrities getting involved, but at the moment, Just Stop Oil is still uh, primarily funded by ordinary members of the public who, uh, well, normally what Just Stop Oil asks is that people give what they make in an hour as a monthly donation. And uh, although some of our more prominent backers will make it into the press, it's still very much um, founded on members of the public making small donations. Um, having been involved in fundraising and spoken to a lot of people on the phone, I can say that there is a lot of public support. You know, people do want to help. If they can't donate, then they're signing up for voluntary roles. A lot of, a lot of people, um, as soon as we get in touch with them after they've signed a petition um, or something, are, are really keen to come out and uh, do things like marches like, like straight away. So, uh, having spoken to a lot of people that's that's reassuring you know when you when you actually speak to members of the public um so yeah it, it's not an organization like an ngo such as greenpeace or whatever um it's that's been established for decades and has you know quite quite an, it is quite an affluent organization um so it is essential yeah that, that members of the public uh, give give what they can can i say right and um, so Look in the link on this video now and you'll find three links. First of all, donate to Just the Poil. Second, donate to Rebels in Prison Support. The, uh, and third, you'll find our Patreon link. If you can't take action, but you, you, you could do donate like, a, I don't know, like a five or a month or something like that. Um, you've got three choices there. Your, money, when it, when you, your donations to Just the Poil will be used to pay for accommodation in more activists going down to London to continue applying pressure on the government. The money you send to Rebels in Prison Support will go to an organisation that supports climate activists and other activists for worthy causes who are in prison right now. I think there's like three or four of them in total, including Morgan and Marcus, maybe myself soon. And that money is used to like, help with um, have, being able to have phone credit in prison so you can call your friends and family um, for... Uh, paying for e emails so, so your friends and family can email you, uh, paying for prisoner voicemail so you can get voicemails in prison. And thirdly, the Patreon account is our Patreon account for Activism Uncensored. If you donate to the Patreon, that is where your money will be going to. You'll be investing it in this podcast. Uh, is there anything else you want to say? You want to hold it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and if you are choosing to come out... Um, you know, you don't. If you do want to come to London, you don't have to do it for a full week. You know, a lot of people are coming down uh, for a day or two if they can. We understand that people have full-time jobs, people have families, uh, can't be there for the full week that their regions uh, going to be slow marching. Um, and you can do stuff in your local area. You can help organise talks. You can help raise awareness. You can volunteer um, to help uh, leaflet and, and put up posters, or maybe mm. even run talks of your own um, and just to 
let people know what Just Up Oil are about, which is, by the way, to end the 134 new fossil fuel licences. Uh, we're still hearing from our critics, even on the roadside, that they think that Just Up Oil are against the entirety of all usage, which would be absolutely ridiculous um, in the reductions that we know we have to make. It's taken into account that we still have agriculture, we still have till, till agriculture, um, we'll still need oil for manufacturing and these things, but that just goes to, because we will still need oil for that use, it just shows how much we have to turn things around in other areas, specifically how we light and heat people's homes, which is a great part of our carbon output. I just wanted to say as well, when you, when you said about um, leafleting and outreach, like these are things you can do uh, right at the very beginning as soon as you join. So if you're interested in just the oil, you don't have to get arrested or even go down to London. You don't have to, if you want, you can just literally come to a social event where, either a social event where we literally just go to either a pub, a park, and you socialise with other people who are new to Just the Pile and people who are not so new to Just the Pile, I might say. Um, and you can just, just you can discuss like strategy, the climate, your concerns, your own. Um, you can talk about your own issues about what you know maybe why your, your worries and your things about going into action, you know, because there are lots of roles in, the, in, in this organisation and it goes further than just this organisation because we're a community, like Just the Pile, uh, Extinction Rebellion, Animal Rebellion, um, Rising. Animal Rising, sorry, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, a Palestine Action, like we're all one big community and we're all fighting the same battle. We're yeah. fighting against this corporate, racist, greedy state that controls all of our Western democracies or most of them. Yeah, And organisations are coming together uh, like we saw at the Not My Bill demonstration. Over 20 organisations came together for that. That was the first time that the Gypsy uh, Traveller League had been on a protest uh, because they're affected by the Public Order Bill as well. They're under threat by this legislation and actually they ceremonially took a coffin down from Parliament Square, down Whitehall, to the gates of Downing Street, and then went in to deliver a letter of protest. That was the first time that a gypsy traveller had been into Downing Street uh, in history. So that goes to show, historically, people are coming together, organisations are coming together. That was, that was really beautiful uh, to see. And JR, who is the head of the Gypsy Travellers League, um, said it would said it was you know amazing he sees the power that people have now he recognizes the power of protest and what people can do if we all solidify and come together and to be there outside the gates of Downing Street at that moment was actually like quite emotional um, so keep it up not every organization agrees on everything but let's just stick with what we do agree on because this public order bill affects every single one of us well they're going to be bringing, bringing in more bills really but Let's, let, let's, as a movement, let's collaborate, work together, build ties together, and, well, I'm, I, I'm directly calling for the creation of a new movement, One People, One Planet, to own, have all movements in one movement, all, one people, one planet, with all of, all of our demands, like all the worthy causes, you know? Yeah. With the wor all the, the worthy demands in there. And none of us go home until we've all had a man's met. I said this yesterday on the podcast, but um, yeah, it's, it's what we need right, to see right now. And um, thank you. It's what we need to see right now. And, you know, I refuse to give up. You know, do you know, no matter how bleak it looks, no matter how bleak it looks with the situation of the climate and, and, tipping points that might be being crossed as we speak you know I refuse to give up on humanity I refuse to give up on your children I refuse to give up on my children uh, I haven't got any children but there's a lot of children in my life that I do really care about and god damn like this is part of the emotion that drove me to not go to my own paid work because I'm so deeply hurt by the idea of us losing the, losing the livability of this world. Like, 
this world supports us in, in every way that we know. It, you know, a stable climate provi it provides healthy soils and regular rain. Mm. And with that, we grow our food, feed our livestock, uh, fill our reservoirs, run water out of our taps, and have a civilization. Like, can you imagine if it just stopped raining one day? Like, there's places in Africa, so I had a, I had a, I actually had someone on the podcast the other day, but they refused, but at the end of it, they decided they didn't want it to go on. And she was telling me about, um, she's from Africa, and she was telling me about how she was in a part of Africa, a part of Ethiopia, and she was going there, it was all dried up, and a farmer told her, it's not rained here in four years. Can you imagine? Can you imagine living in the UK or wherever you live in and it doesn't rain for four years and you get like horrendous heat at the same time? Like, there was, there was livestock and animals dead, uh, like along the sides of the road. Most of like, all different kinds, of, like some of them had been there for a while and were just skeletons, and some of them had died recently, and some of them had you know, died a few months ago. But like, all the cattle were dead and all the land had turned to like a dust bowl. So all the, all the healthy nutrient soil where you grow your crops has turned to dust and blown away in the wind. Yeah. And even if it does rain in that country now, like the, rain, the, the, the ground will be so hard and so dry that the water will just run straight off the surface and cause huge floods downstream because the soil cannot take up any, any of that water if it's rock solid. Well, that's it. These are the these are the conditions that people are having to live in. Um, it's either a drought or a flood, and neither of those situations uh, situations where people can live in, where they can grow food. Um, once you do get these huge floods, that causes contamination of previously clean water sources, and these rivers and streams um, that are essential for so many people's lives. They, they kind of they bless the land, you know, essentially. They, they feed into other places and create all these other wonderful, diverse ecosystems. And it's, it's, that's the future, that's, that's what the future holds. It's like just gonna be either drought or flooding. A lot, a lot of people are thinking that we might not have four seasons anymore. Like we'll, we'll just have the, the rain season or the drought season like a lot of countries already have but that's going to spread all over the world it's happening in the global south and in sub-saharan africa right now the, the drought season could last for like years as well it wouldn't be a season but it could be the it could be five years of drought and then maybe maybe six months of pure rain yeah. five years of rain in the six months yeah. just pulls down and washes your house away yeah. um yeah i don't know how we're gonna i mean even if we don't manage to tackle climate change, and even if we did nothing about climate change and continue burning fossil fuels, we could at least spend like billions and billions, even trillions of pounds on safeguarding our, you know, our, our food supply and our water supply by using seawater desalination plants, big industrial sized ones that pull you know, tons and tons, millions and tons of water out of the ocean every year and turns it into fresh water. And we could um, grow lots of food like, a lot of these skyscrapers around Manchester, we could grow food indoor, vertically stacked in layers, and grow our food protected from the climate. So, there are ways of feeding ourselves, but you've got to remember there is eight, is it, um, eight billion people on this planet now, and if you think about all the people who are in poverty, you can't afford food and water as it is right now. Those nations are just going to all of a sudden jump up and start building all these billions of pounds of infrastructure in their nation, we need to go there and do. It. We need to go there and do it for them. Um, so we are advocating for a non-violent civil. We are advocating for a non-violent global revolution, green revolution. Wish me luck. Yesterday at court, I went into I went into the court and I just I told the judge that I wanted to represent myself and that I was going to refuse to do the unpaid work. And the judge literally was trying to convince me to accept the unpaid work. I was expecting to tell the judge that I refused to do the unpaid work and they should 
you know, do a thing and uh, send me to prison. But the judge literally sent, sat there for five minutes trying to convince me to continue my unpaid work, like trying to reason with me. And I was like, not what I was expecting. Um, and then she was saying, don't make me send you to prison. Just continue doing your unpaid work. I was like, oh, I don't know. And <clears throat> she went, right, well, it's either continue your unpaid work or I sentence you for a crime with the maximum sentence of 10 years. And I think she did that on purpose to kind of unnerve me a little bit because I was like, mm, shit, you know, like, um, so she was saying, come on, just do your unpaid work and don't let me send you to prison. And then she started giving me all these reasons, like all these reasons saying, you know, you could just rush through it. You could just uh, comply, get all your rehabilitation orders done and you could have this done in three months. And I was like, oh, for God's sake. So uh, I reluctantly agreed to continue my unpaid work. And I, I regret it already because I don't know if I'm going to be able to continue going. But... Um, <clears throat> As I walked out of the out of the court, I was think, I was I was worried about getting like a big hefty prison sentence to be honest. And I asked the prosecution, uh, "What do you think I would have got as a as a instead of unpaid work as a sentence?" And he reckoned he said, um, "I reckon she would have given I reckon she would have given you a few weeks, but I would have given you like like three months, which is like six weeks anyway." So honestly, I think I would have rather have gone to prison than do the unpaid work. And I feel like I've made a mistake by agreeing to continue the unpaid work. So now I guess we'll see what happens. Um, yeah.